you first met Kurt at a Big Black concert in 87, is this correct? Yeah, that was another thing that I didn't know at the time that I was talking to him. I, I found that out later during the session was that my band, Big Black, played its last ever concert at the Georgetown Steam Plant on Boeing Field in Seattle. And uh, Kurt was at that show, and he, after the show, like at the end of the show, as a kind of a, a nod to the finality of the event, of this being our last show, we smashed all of our guitars and stuff on stage. At the end of the show, this this kid came up to me and picked up a piece of the my uh, of my broken guitar off the stage and he asked me if he could could keep it and i said yeah sure you know it's garbage now you know yeah, yeah. and uh then i found out through working on the session that that kid that had asked me about it, about taking a piece of my guitar was kurt cobain no way really and did you ever end up talking to him about that I mean, that much. That's what we talk. That's you've just heard the whole story. <laughs> One of the distinctive elements of In Utero, in my opinion, is the raspiness of Kurt's voice. Like, I mean, he screams at all the records, but I really find with Bleach and In Utero in particular, he's really letting loose. Um, with a song like Tourette's, he's basically just screaming the whole time. Uh, did he ever blow out his voice when he was uh, recording that record? I don't recall anything specific, although he basically sang the whole album in one go, and I think he paced it so that the less demanding songs would be early in the session, and then the harsher songs would be at the end. And then I do recall him coming in the next day and revisiting a couple of those songs, either redoing parts or whole chunks of songs. The first song you guys did was Serve the Servants. Did you get yeah. any of the arrangements for the music before you started recording or was everything just you get there and for the first time you're hearing these songs? They had sent me Rio demo, which was a demo tape that they had made in Rio de Janeiro that had most of the songs from the session and a few loose jams. The arrangements were all pretty worked out, you know, and Kurt had ideas about for each song he had little extra bits that he wanted to do either a second guitar or uh, a contrasting uh part that he wanted to to add that was not that wasn't necessarily structural but there would be like okay well we get to this bit going to be a second guitar that's going to take over or going to join and um yeah there wasn't a, not a lot of it was extemporaneous. Hmm. Almost all of it was, in one way or another, was worked out. You know, Kurt had a notebook that had his lyrics and his song ideas in it. In that notebook, he also had articulated specific things about the guitar sound. Like he wanted to swap amplifiers for certain songs. He used a, a Randall amplifier for some of it. He hmm. used the bulk of it was this broken Fender quad reverb that he really liked. Serve the Servant specifically, I know that he used this broken quad reverb, and it was missing three of the four power tubes. So the output of the amplifier was, in technical terms, it was asymmetrical, meaning that there would be distortion on one half of the waveform and not on the other half. And that would be, you know, an unusual thing, but it and it had a very harsh, distorted sound, but uh, Kurt was actually quite fond of that harshness. And, and so that was a, a big part of that record was him choosing a very specific voicing for each guitar. Is there anything in particular about these sessions that stick out to you? There are a couple of very specific things about Kurt's approach that um, were unique at the time and remain unique. Um, he, he essentially sang the entire album in one sitting. Really? Um, I think he came back the next day and did a few of the songs that... You know, he may have redone a song or did a few of the songs that he didn't get to the first day. But essentially, we started the vocal tracking and then we just pressed on that whole day and he sang the whole album. Um, <clears throat> that by itself is pretty unusual. Um, his approach to singing was that while he was singing, he always wanted to be playing an instrument of some kind. In the beginning, he had this percussion instrument called a rain stick that he was toying with while he was doing the vocals. Mm -hmm. 
and it it made this you know brutal rattling sound that was picking up in the vocal microphones and then when he heard the first playback he was like hey can you get rid of that rain stick <laughs> and i was like yeah sorry that's built in you know so he ended up re-singing that song but um and then he switched to this slightly broken acoustic guitar he had this acoustic guitar that had a cracked top and had very old very dead strings and he would just strum along quietly while he was preparing to sing the song and there are a couple of songs where you can hear this acoustic guitar sort of accompanying the quiet bits of the verse and that wasn't a separate recording of an acoustic guitar that was just the acoustic guitar he was carrying in his lap that he was using as a, a, a um, sort of a rhythmic confidence item during the singing. And so that acoustic guitar was uh, a byproduct of his method of recording the vocals. I felt like he was being very square and very open with me during the session. Like he would tell me what he liked and what he didn't like, and I believed him. Mm -hmm. Is it true that they set their pants on fire when you guys finished the record? <laughs> Uh, there's a cleaning solvent that you use to clean the tape heads on the tape machines, which is very flammable. And you can also splash that solvent on something else and set it on fire. And so we were setting a lot of stuff on fire during the session, just, <laughs> you know, jackass entertainment sort of stuff. There's a photo somewhere. I, I, I can't remember who took it, but there's an, there was an Instamatic or a, um, a Polaroid photo of Dave Grohl's ass on fire fire and I think it's Chris Novoselic is lighting a cigar off of the fire that's on Dave Grohl's ass. Um, I would set my feet on fire every now and again. Uh, yeah, all, all of that sort of stuff is just killing time in the studio. It didn't, didn't hurt at all or anything? No, no, that's what's cool about it. The solvent evaporates as it's burning, so it's cooling you down while it's burning. So, And there's no fire alarms or anything in the in the building? I mean... <laughs> I don't want to get anybody in trouble, but maybe not, you know. <laughs> cool. So now, I mean, was the session, um, I take it, it was a fun session. Like, did you enjoy working with the band? Yeah, we got along great. Like, I I wasn't the biggest fan of Nirvana going into the session. I have to admit that. I, you know, I wasn't that familiar with their music, but what I had heard had been kind of thrust at me by the, the hype machine. And, and I wasn't into it. It wasn't my cup of tea. Getting to work with them, getting to see them in action, the way the band in, interacted with each other internally, the way Kurt expressed himself, and the the way he sort of um, openly indulged his influences, uh, all of that was very endearing, and I developed a great respect for them as a band and and for Kurt as a as a guy. Uh, and I, I think they were a great band and I think that's a great record and I'm, I'll always be gratified that I was involved in those sessions. What was your favorite song to work on during the recording sessions? I remember really liking the Milk It song. Uh, really? yeah. and then there was the one that we were calling the name game. Uh, the one that goes, ba, 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 da, ba, da, 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 da. Uh, Sound the Surprise? That, yeah. Um, I remember at the time. It's uh, Dave Grohl called it the name game because the, the rhythm is sort of Charlie, Charlie, Fo Farley, Banana, Fana, Fo Farley, like that. It has the, the same rhythm as the name game. Yeah, I thought that was a really distinctive use of that rhythm, which I was is underutilized. Now, I know that uh, Kurt was a big fan of the Pixies, and one of the reasons he wanted to work with you in particular was your work you've done with them. Well, the fundamental aspects of the sessions, the Pixie session and the Nirvana session were very similar. That is, the band played the material live as a as a performing ensemble there were some extra bits added as overdubs but the principal sound that you're hearing is the sound of that band playing live together yeah so in that sense they're they're very similar that's a working method that i've used for all types of music and and all kinds of ensembles if the band is capable of playing simultaneously mm -hmm. then you get the best interaction the most natural together sound quality by having them play together normally as they would in rehearsal or on stage. 
So that that aspect of it was the same identically. A lot of the, some of the recording techniques, some of the recording techniques with respect to the drum kit and the guitars, for example, were the same. Mm -hmm. That's just by virtue of the fact that um, I had been through a long experimental process of trying to find techniques that worked for different sound qualities. And some of the sonor sonorities and some of the sound qualities were similar. Mm -hmm. Like they wanted a, a, a big, booming, ambient drum sound. So I made use of the ambient sound of the room in the same, very similar manner to the way I did with the Pixies. There were some songs that had a very brash, very aggressive sound quality. And so I would modify the recording style there. We moved the drums, for example, from the large live room into a much smaller ante room that was sort of a, a, a kitchen entrance area that was a non-professional space. That is, it wasn't designed as an acoustic space, but it had a nice, lively sound quality. So for some of the more brash, more aggressive songs, we shifted the drums into this smaller, brighter room, Okay. Uh, for example. Um, and those are, you know, those things suiting the sound quality to the song in question, mm -hmm. those are things that would be normal for any session. Within the pantheon of the thousands of albums that you worked on, where would you rank in utero in terms of your personal preference? Well, I don't listen to like I don't listen to a lot of records that I've worked on for fun. There's something slightly vain about that that makes me uncomfortable. So I don't I don't listen to a lot of music that I've worked on for entertainment. But whenever I hear that record, I'm always very satisfied with the way it, it came out. So, you know, you did something very unique that most producers don't do. Uh, you took a flat rate to work with the band instead of taking the typical royalty thing, even though you may have made more money with that. Uh, what was your reasoning behind that? If if you were doing some creative endeavor, right, mm -hmm. and I was facilitating your creative endeavor, I just don't see that that it's reasonable that you should, for the rest of your life, you should be beholden to me. Yeah. Well, that's very honorable of you, Steve, because most people wouldn't think that way. I genuinely don't feel like I'm being a, an overly generous person in this regard. I just feel like if you see a room full of people and they're all behaving horribly and you just carry on your normal life not behaving horribly, that doesn't make you noble. You know, that doesn't mean that you're an extra special person. It just means that there was all of this awful shit going on and you didn't participate in it. Hmm. Interesting way of looking at things, yeah. So, um, speaking of the, you know, some of the bad stuff that happened, uh, interestingly, that letter you sent to Nirvana, you specifically stated, you know, potential problems that may run into you with the label. When those exact problems you foretold actually did happen, I'm assuming you weren't surprised. So, how did how did you take it? Uh, like you said, I, I wasn't surprised. There was an active attempt to to wreck my career on the part of the people associated with that record that record label and uh i'm you know clearly it didn't it didn't work like i'm still here making records every day and they're all selling insurance or timeshares or something you know yeah so i i don't feel bad about the way things turned out but that was a rough year i'm, I'm really sorry you had to go through that when did you first yeah. when did you Chase first realize that this was happening that this was starting to develop these problems um, well, the first inkling was when the band called me and said, yeah, the record label and the management hate the record. They want, they want us to redo it all. And I was like, yeah, I kind of saw that one coming. I mean, I think the trajectory of that record, that is them going off to make the record on their own, the record label stamping their feet about it and trying to get them to change it, them ultimately making some changes, the record coming out in a, in a way that, um, was less than satisfying for me, given that the, their record label and their management tried to scapegoat me like pretty aggressively prior to the release. Like all of that, that whole trajectory, I think that was kind of preordained. I don't think there's any way they could have gotten out of that record without something like that happening. Whoever the, their engineer was, something on that spectrum was going to happen. Some, some combination of those those events was going to happen mm -hmm. given that it did i feel like they navigated it about as well as anybody could mm -hmm. for my part i might have been 
I'm, I'm, I, I was more of a prick then. I, I was more like willing to irritate people. And so I think I was probably, I was probably a little coarser about uh, my reaction to it, to all of those things than was necessary. And I, I'd like to think that I wouldn't behave that way now. It was a very dark time for me. The year after I did that record, I almost went, I went completely broke the year after making that record. Um, there was an, there was an aggressive campaign on the part of Geffen records um, to, to discredit me or embarrass me or try to cause me harm, which was effective in that I lost a lot of business in the, in the intervening year or so. But I don't personalize that toward the band. I feel like the band were the, the one party in all of this who were not taking shots at me, you know? Yeah. They were very circumspect when they were talking about the process of making the record and interviews and stuff. Like, they, they didn't want to ruffle any feathers. And so they didn't personalize their complaints um, very much. I'm gratified by the fact that they didn't scapegoat me to the extent, you know, that their record label and their management did. Uh, it's it was a surreal experience to have this big corporation have invested a lot of money and their sort of publicity capital in a record by the biggest band in the world and have those very self-same people shit talking me to music journalists and other people in the music business and actively trying to cause me harm that was a very surreal experience for them to be shitting on this record that was obviously very important to them from a business standpoint it was going to be a huge record and i just didn't get why they were shitting on the record and then as a secondary effect shitting on me i just didn't get it and it was a, it was an unpleasant period for me the year after making that record I saw a big drop off in my normal clientele, like the smaller bands that I was working with, the independent bands. A, a lot of them were suspicious of me now because I had been working. I'd worked on this big hit record and that that made them suspicious of me and my motives. Like mm -hmm. there was a kind of a normal career trajectory where somebody would start out in the underground and they would start to get noticed and then they would become sort of a mainstream player and then unavailable to anybody who wasn't a like a, a big name yeah something similar to that had happened with butch vig like who who was a hero in the underground in the punk scene then his name was associated with nirvana and suddenly you nobody that he had none of the bands that were his bread and butter in the years prior none of them could get him get him to answer a phone call and that's just a result of him moving into a sort of a professional tier where those bands didn't have access, right? Mm -hmm. So there was a suspicion of me that that was going to, that, that, that was sort of expected to happen with me, that I would now be unavailable to all of my normal clientele. So that normal clientele disappeared or dropped off dramatically. And then the sort of mainstream or major label artists were being actively discouraged from working with me. And I know this because I have friends who were in the process of making records in the year or two after that, yeah. who were told explicitly by their handlers that they were not allowed to work with me. They could work with basically anybody else. They just weren't allowed to work with me. That's um, crazy that this happened to you, man. I'm really sorry. Well, <laughs> I, it was a boys club. It was an in, it was a, it was a closed circle in the mainstream music business and I represented a way of working that would negate that network. And so I'm not surprised at all that people were discouraged from working with me. But I can imagine um, that there must have been other individuals who are also very much in line with the punk ethos. Why were they so intimidated by you in particular? I don't know that people were intimidated by me. I think that people saw me as a liability. 
Like if you're in a if you're involved with a a big record label and your relationship with them is somewhat fragile, meaning that they could they could wreck you, they could ruin your career. You would not want to antagonize those people by working with someone that they saw as uh, an obstacle or that they saw as someone that they saw as an impediment to them doing their normal, going through their normal modes of behavior. And then if you were a small band and you were, you aspired to being picked up by one of these big record labels and it was made clear to you that I was a pariah in that world, you also wouldn't want to associate yourself with me because you wouldn't want to be tarred with this brush of, oh, they're a, a, a defiant um, indie band and they, you know, yeah, that would they would close some doors on themselves if they did that. So I, I, you know, I basically had to rebuild my clientele from the, you know, the deep underground network from the, you know, the peer group of people who were not part of that aspirational world. And I had, you know, existing clients, people that I had worked with for years that that stuck with me. But I had to rebuild my new clientele from the ground up, basically. Jeez. I'll never forget the moment. There was a moment maybe six months or so after the release of that record where I did I I had did the books on the studio and I paid all the utilities and I paid the salaries for the other employees and I paid the insurance and I paid everything and and I had 50 cents in the bank. Like my bank balance after paying all my bills and paying doing payroll and the mortgage and everything my my bank balance was 50 cents and that was you know unusual for me at the time because i had been working very steadily and i had built up a bit of a cushion which allowed me to survive that fallow period you know the 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 band made the record on their own terms so you know with all this said with you know the issue with the different mixing in 2013 when you know you got to go back to the vaults and do the deluxe edition with the band. How was that experience for you? The best thing that I can say about that experience, that experience was great. Like getting to rekindle my friendship with Chris Novoselic and getting to spend time with Chris and Dave and Pat, like that experience was great. Mm -hmm. And hearing those original recordings again, was immensely satisfying because, you know, just listening to the playback of the final tape, the final mixes of the original session, I was so satisfied with all the decisions that we'd made. And I was very pleased that the sound quality was as good as I remembered it being. And, you know, and I was very pleased that we were getting a, getting a chance to see it through in a manner that wouldn't have, wasn't possible in the nineties, you know, yeah. granted Nirvana were a very big band in the nineties, but they were also one of a couple of dozen records that came out that month. <clears throat> so they weren't going to get the kind of specific intimate attention that you could lavish on a record that you knew had a, an, an audience waiting and, and where you knew that the, the, the cost was not going to be an obstacle, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. I have to give the band credit here. They asked my opinion about what would be the best way to do a reissue for the record. And I said, mm. go to the original master tapes, use the best possible cutting technique for the vinyl master, which is the DMM process. And my suggestion was to do it at Abbey Road, where I had oh. had very good results mastering records over the years. And to have me supervise the cut and if possible to do it as an expanded double disc, 12 inch 45. And they went for all of it. They said, yep, let's do it. Let's do all of that stuff. And I honestly don't know how to do it better. Like if, if somebody said, what steps would you take to make the best possible master from a recording that you'd done? Mm -hmm. I would say, let's do all of these steps in this way. And Nirvana did all of those steps in that way. And they went to bat for that process with the record label. 
I don't know what the record label would have originally been prepared to do, mm -hmm. but um, the band went to bat for that method, and they made it clear that that would be that's how they wanted to proceed. And the results speak for themselves. I think that's the best sounding record that I've ever been associated with in terms of its the sound quality of the record as it relates to the sound quality of the master material. Like if you play the double 12 inch deluxe edition of that record at home, you are hearing as close to what we heard in the studio as it is possible to get. I saw a video from a while back. You found these microphones that you used to record in utero and you donated them to the band or whatever it was. Um, do you have any memorabilia from the sessions that you've kept for yourself? Honestly, I don't, I can't think of anything. Uh, I know that at the time, like, when we did that session, the the mics that I was using on Kurt's voice were easily identifiable. And then there was a, after the deluxe edition came out, there was a, a photograph that Bob Weston had taken, a picture of those microphones um, in the arrangement that was used for the vocal recording. And... It, I realized at that point that what those microphones were was less tools that I could use on a daily basis and more artifacts that were of historical significance. Um, if I couldn't identify which microphones they were, then it wouldn't concern me. Then I would just carry on using them as normal. But because it was obvious which specific microphones they were, then you have this relic which has intrinsic value because of its association right and then it it becomes irresponsible to risk that by putting it on a mic stand where it could get kicked over and smashed and it becomes a liability if that thing has intrinsic value that you then put it in harm's way where it could get destroyed like you had like so like having the original copy of the constitution on your coffee table where somebody could spill coffee on it. You yeah. Know? It just, it, it made me uncomfortable. And I contacted, uh, Dave Grohl and Chris Novoselic. And I said, Hey, I have these microphones. They are clearly very valuable now. Whereas previously they were just sort of workman like tools. Do you have a central repository for Nirvana relics? Do you want them? And both of them instantly, like without hesitation, both of them said, you should sell those mics. Hmm. And it seemed like that was the way to get them into the hands of somebody who would be a responsible caretaker for them. And so we sold them. We made a pretty good clip of money on them, but the money wasn't enough to make it worth selling something of significance if it, if it wasn't going to be... A, a better utility for those mics than having them here where they would be in, in danger every day. I heard something very, I thought it was quite funny about you during the sessions. Um, apparently you did a prank call to Eddie Vedder and pretended you were a David Bowie's producer. Yeah, there were, a num there were a number of opportunities for prank calls during that session. The, the Eddie Vedder one, there was a kind of a, good natured rivalry between Nirvana and Pearl Jam, like Pearl Jam were sort of the corporate face of the era. You know, the, the band was kind of assembled from constituent parts and was shopped as a product. And then it was very much an industry creation as it were, whereas Nirvana were a, a grubby band that played in all the punk bars and worked their way up sort of incrementally worked their way up to a, a position of status and where their audience just grew organically because they kept playing in front of more and more people and more and more people were responding to them. And so there was a, a contrast there between the sort of working musician underground, which I felt like I was a part of and which Nirvana were a part of and where we had a, a, a common peer group. And then this sort of industry creation uh, which was at odds with, with their ethics and their aesthetic. Hmm. So there was a bit of a rivalry between Pearl Jam and Nirvana in that regard. Um, and uh, yeah, it was just a, sp a sort of a spontaneous spoof. 
uh, called Eddie Vedder and uh, I I said that I was Tony Visconti. Tony Visconti. Yeah. So I called. We called Eddie Vedder and I said that you know I was Tony Visconti and I wanted to get him in a studio with some real musicians, guys who could really play. <laughs> Uh, I don't remember much else about the conversation, but uh, the gist of it was that I was trying to, to tempt him to do a solo record um, and assemble a superstar backing band for him. And did he fall for it? I don't know. I mean, he <laughs> indulged me, but I, I, I couldn't tell if he was indulging me because he thought I was really Tony Visconti or because he... he he didn't want to take the bait on something that might have been a prank call. So if Nirvana was around today, given how dispersed things are and given the nature of the Internet and how it's hard to just pinpoint one person, do you think they would have become as big as they did? Everything that happens is a confluence of the influence of the circumstances and the influences of the of the time. So. At the moment, nobody watches MTV for videos for music videos. So if a band had a a moment of success due to a, a successful music video that that avenue is probably not there anymore. You know, if there was a, a band that had a successful hype campaign and, and payola and were being splashed on the radio a lot now, nobody listens to the radio. So who knows if that would have any effect whatsoever? It's just the, the world operates differently now. And I'd like to think that a distinctive a stylish and distinctive band that is a unique and genuine aesthetic, like that they would still find an audience. I do think, I do think that there's a, there's a kind of an appeal to authenticity that rock music fans have that I think is, is misguided. Like people think of learning to play the guitar and playing the guitar is somehow validating. Whereas learning to, learning to use a sampler and assembling ideas using digital techniques for whatever reason isn't valid. I, I think that's a specious argument. I think that, you know, I, I just don't, I don't think these little turf battles have meaning. I learned to play the guitar and I use the guitar because that's my instrument of facility. Right. But I can't, I can't denigrate somebody else using different techniques and different tools to express themselves. Um, I, yeah, I just don't, I, I don't see that one idiom is fundamentally better or more valid or more authentic than another. Uh, I'm not, if I were to leap into the computerized world of digital music right now, I would be bad at it. And it doesn't appeal to me enough to make me want to overcome that hurdle and become good at it. So I'm going to persist with the tools that I'm already proficient with and, and hope that my ideas can transcend the, the execution, right? Mm -hmm. By the same token, I wouldn't expect somebody whose only experience with music is doing sample collages and using MIDI instruments and that sort of thing. I wouldn't expect that person to be able to translate to a live performance model comfortably and easily, I think that that would be a mistaken expectation as well. So Steve, you yourself are well known for your high quality of drum production, and you have worked with some of the world's most iconic drummers, including of course, Dave Grohl. So what was that experience like for you, being someone that is an aficionado when it comes to recording drums, to get to work with someone at Dave Grohl's caliber? Dave is a monster. Uh, he's a, a very good musician sort of generally, but there really are very few drummers of his caliber on earth or who have ever lived. He's often associated with the most powerful moments of Nirvana because, you know, he had a very physical approach to the drums. But I think his tastefulness and his tact and his dynamic sense are underrated. Hmm. On um, on quite a few of the songs, he scales everything back to a very simple, very clean rhythm 
in the quieter parts of the songs in order to give himself headroom to really attack the drums in the louder parts of the songs. And I think that's something that he doesn't get enough credit for, of, hmm. of really playing to the arrangement of the music and playing to the dynamic of, of the song. I don't, I don't think he gets enough credit for that. His drum parts themselves are inventive. Like on that record alone, there are two or three drum beats where if you just play a bar of the drums, people would know which song it was because the, the drums are as, as much of an identifier of the music or as much of a yeah. signature riff as any other part of the, of the music. Um, so you really feel that Dave is one of the best drummers of all time? Easily, yeah. Wow. I mean, certainly, I, I've worked with a lot of drummers. I've worked with some phenomenal drummers you know, real world beaters, real crushers. And he's at the very, very top of, of my experience recording drummers. That's wow. That's quite the compliment. So my skill set with uh, recording drums developed over the years by recording the loudest and most aggressive drummers out there. I was able to use a fairly normal approach that is close mics on the drums, distant ambient mics to capture the room sound, my approach to the drum kit is not to try to record the individual drums as isolated sounds, but to record the whole of the drum kit in the set. I've always thought of it sort of as a kind of bully's piano, you know, huh. like you wouldn't try to record the individual strings and hammers of the piano and then reassemble them in the mixing stage. You try to capture the sound quality of the whole piano and present it that way. You can shift the emphasis one way or the other using mic placement or technique, but the the net effect of it should be that um, it should evoke the sensation of listening to a single instrument. And that's the way I've always approached the drums is you might have a mic that's special, uh, that's uh, specifically for the bass drum, but you're not recording the bass drum in isolation of the other sounds. There, there's a microphone that's recording the snare drum, but that microphone is also hearing the rest of the drum kit in the ambient environment, that mm -hmm. sort of thing. So uh, what about Chris Novoselic? How, how does he line up in the bass world? He's an interesting guy, very cerebral guy. <clears throat> and I think his, his perception of the, his role in the band was not particularly well voiced in his bass playing. Like his bass playing was very solid and, uh, you know, tonally was very deep and very heavy. Um, he had, you know, there, there would occasionally be lighter moments where he would be playing portal stuff or playing up the neck, whatever. But the most of the time, he was playing sort of the left hand of the piano, as it were, where, hmm. like, he was playing the, the tonic movement of the music and Kurt was adding all of the harmonic and emotional content but the song carried on because you could tell you could tell the song was carrying on no matter how wild the guitar got because chris was sort of keeping his pace through the whole thing as opposed to like going off on a on a journey on his own you know mary gold is a song written by dave grohl which was originally released on an album called Pocket Watch, which essentially was a Dave Grohl solo cassette tape. Even though he didn't credit himself as Dave Grohl, he used the pseudonym Late. This original version of Marigold, which appears on Pocket Watch, was recorded on December 23, 1990, in Arlington, Virginia, with producer Barrett Jones. In February of 1993, during the In Utero sessions, Steve Albini recorded another version of Marigold. Here he is discussing a little bit about that experience. With your session, if I remember correctly, you guys recorded 14 songs, 12 got on the record. Sappy and I Hate Myself and Want to Die were not included. Do you know why those two songs were not included on the release? Uh, not my call. Yeah, I, I didn't. I wasn't involved in those conversations. Mm -hmm. I hear you. There was also a, a song, one of Dave Grohl's songs, yeah. Marigold, that ended yeah. up being used uh, as a B-side that was recorded during the same sessions. Did you record the Marigold um, record? Recorded the basic recording of it, but the the greater production of it, that is the um, overdubs and the mixing and everything, Dave Grohl did that as a sort of a side hustle with Bob Weston. 
as the principal engineer. Bob Weston was there with me the whole time. Um, he was there to make sure that if there were technical problems that we could get stuff fixed on the spot. And it was very helpful. Um, it sort of cemented our friendship as well, working in that kind of an environment. And his girlfriend at the time was the, sh the chef for the session. Like she was living there and she was doing all the meals and uh, meal prep for the, the daily ordeal there. Although not officially released as part of In Utero, Marigold does appear on the box set with the lights out, which was released in 2004. And Dave Grohl has stated that during the early stages of the Foo Fighters, when most people at that point in time still knew him predominantly as Nirvana's drummer, audiences at the early Foo Fighters crowds would often enthusiastically cheer and ask for Dave to perform Marigold. Even so, Marigold was not performed live until July 14, 2006 during a Foo Fighters concert, and it would be played throughout the rest of that tour. The original title for Marigold was Color Pictures of a Marigold. Marigolds being a yellowish-orange flower. You know, I've read different things about how you and the band got in touch. I read that you heard rumors and you sent them a fax saying that you don't really know if you're working with them. How exactly did you guys end up working together? The stories you've heard are correct. Like, there, there were rumors being floated in the press that I was going to be asked to work on this postulated next Nirvana album, but um, no one had contacted me. Like officially, no one had spoken to me about it. There, I had gotten a few late night phone calls from what I later discerned was Kurt Cobain, but at the time I just was just a disembodied voice on the phone of someone quite inebriated wanting to talk about various <laughs> records I'd worked on. Kurt saying, yeah, I'm sorry about those rumors, but, you know, we were talking within the band and in front of other people. We were talking about asking you to work on this record. What would you think about it? And then he and I had a, a fairly involved conversation about what would be entailed in making a record. Sort of recapped in a, a letter that I wrote yeah. so that the other band members could basically have all the info that I had given Kurt in that phone call. So the I, I wrote a letter to the band explaining my position of, you know, I want to work on your record in the way that I work on everybody's records. That is, you and me would go to the studio, you would make the decisions, I would help you make the record, we wouldn't listen to anybody outside that core group. And if you wanted to make a record that way, then I'm, you know, I'm happy to give it a shot. And that that was sort of the working method and that was articulated in that letter. And I also talked about, you know, the nuts and bolts stuff, like how much time it would take, what studio options should be, um, how I would go about getting paid, who would be responsible for paying me, how much money I would be willing to take and yada, yada. All of that all sort of, sort of boiled down into a synopsis that was then shared with the rest of the band. I knew that in their position, Nirvana were going to be badgered by other people wanting to glom on to their success and wanting to siphon off some of their credibility for themselves. And that they want that there were going to be a lot of people leeching off of them for my own peace of mind and for their peace of mind. I wanted them to know that they didn't have to worry about me and be confident that I was going to do a good job without any of the distractions of the celebrity lifestyle or any of that sort of thing. They went outside the record label system and made a record on their own and then brought it back to the label and said, this is our record, please put it out. That behavior, that act represented a threat to the paradigm of the record label where the record label is in charge and responsible for significant decisions about a band's career, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So they had an incentive to see that that method failed and that the band wasn't allowed to proceed with putting a record out that they had made on their own terms. Mm -hmm. So they were incentivized to try to get the band to scrap the record and do it again. Mm -hmm. And it's to the band's credit, it's to Nirvana's credit that they said, no, this is the way we did it and that we like this record and we want to put it out. 
in the end, there were a few songs that were remixed. I, I genuinely believe that that was because the band found fault with those original mixes. I don't believe that it was done as a concession to the record label, although it could be viewed that way, or and it and it could be a coincidence that the singles were the songs that were ended up ended up being reworked. Um, but I genuinely believe that the band had reservations and they wanted to rework those songs, so they did. And in the end, the album that made its way into the stores, the album that you could go buy, was precisely exactly the album that the band wanted you to hear. There's no way to work the math where I didn't cost myself a million or so by not taking a royalty on that record. As a nominal figure, let's say the band was getting 12 points or 12% of the income of the record. Mm -hmm. And the producer was being paid a couple of those, literally be subtracted from the band's income. Given the other expenses that the band has to carry, how it would almost always work out that the producer would be being paid more than the band members. Really? And that was by design. That's the way the industry was structured so that industry players would be overcompensated and that musicians would be undercompensated and, and band members and songwriters would be undercompensated. Um, and I just didn't want to participate in that system. I, I thought that system was corrupt and unethical and I, I, I did not want to be in the same way that I did not want to be one of the people leeching off of Nirvana's success and popularity on a personal level. I didn't want to be a drag on their income. I didn't want to be a drain on the hard won compensation that they were going to be getting. Like They did the hard part of writing all this music and touring the world and becoming popular and famous. And then they did the hard part in the studio of executing it all. And then they were going to have to do the hard part of carrying that record around with them for the rest of their lives as part of their legacy. And I just didn't see, I, and I still don't see it as ethical for me to insist on being paid forever for a couple of weeks work. That just, it just seems unconscionable to me. So I, I just refuse to participate in that kind of arrangement. Um, and also, like, I like doing my job. I like making records for people. And so that means as long as I can keep getting work, as long as I keep making records for people, I should have a steady income. And I, I shouldn't make it other people's responsibility to pay me for having done a job a while ago. Like, it just seems like that just seems reasonable. All of these positions seem like normal thought processes to me. It doesn't seem strange or unusual. It's only in the perverse context of the norms of the music business where that could be seen as unusual thinking. All that you can ask from an artist is for them to have a vision, to see their vision through to satisfactory completion, and then present it to you in a manner that they are comfortable with. Mm -hmm. Like Nirvana said, yeah, this is our album, it's finished, this is what we want you to buy, and that was it. Um, it's their record, they're allowed to make those decisions, and the fact that it might bruise my feelings slightly that, you know, something that I worked on got reworked slightly, that's completely irrelevant. Hey guys, thanks for watching. If you like this interview I did with Steve Albini, make sure to subscribe for more because there is a 